If you have or suspect you may have a health problem, or if you require answers to specific health care questions or concerns, you should consult your physician or health care provider and not depend solely on information presented in this program. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Garner, and welcome to the 12th season of Ask the Doctor. As you know, this program was created to assist you in understanding your health. It's more important than ever to be an informed patient, and we are here to bring you timely discussions. Now, for those who are new to the show, there are two ways to get your questions in. First, you can call our live phone line at 718-499-6101. And now the new feature, you can email us questions during the show to askthedoctor at netny.net, and we'll bring them into discussion for tonight. Now, for this episode, I have Dr. Anastasia Nikitna, a cardiology attending at the New York Methodist Hospital. Next to her is Dr. Gerard Lombardo, Director of Center of Sleep Disorder at New York Methodist Hospital. And then we have Dr. Michael Abbott, Pulmonary and Geriatric Medicine Specialist at the New York Methodist Hospital. Welcome to all of you. And we have really a great show tonight. I'm really, really excited about this. We have Dr. Abbott joining us for the first time, and Dr. Lombardo and Nikitna for return appearances. And we're going to be getting to them in a second. As you know, we're going, to, we're going to try and do in the news, but a little bit abbreviated segment because we have so much going on tonight. So one thing that I thought was interesting was breast cancer prevention, how to beat breast cancer, how, if any way, even if you have DNA or inherited the trait. And it seems that if you exercise, maintain your normal weight, a good weight for your age and for your height, and then most importantly, have limited alcohol. And when you ask what's the safe amount, actually the best is none if you could have none, because alcohol seems to be one of the factors that causes breast cancer in some way. And there is no safe amount. So do within moderation. A drink every couple of days is fine. But I would not do more than that. Now, the other thing we're going to get to with Dr. Lombardo in a while is a study came out this week showing that lack of sleep increases your weight. So people that were, couldn't figure out why they were gaining weight in spite of dieting when they looked further, they weren't getting enough sleep, and enough sleep is eight hours a night. They were getting five hours, six hours a night. Also, those who went to sleep with the light on had a hard time losing weight. So it's an interesting thing to think about. We're going to be here with Dr. Lombardo, and what, I, what I'm very excited about, Sleep to Save Your Life. This book um, can be obtained in Amazon, uh, different areas. We'll talk to Dr. Lombardo about that, and, and if you're not getting a good night's sleep, how, how you can get a good night's sleep. So we'll get into that in a little while. Now, the myths for the week. We have a new segment, Dr. Nikita. You weren't here for this, where we do myths of the week, common, commonly held beliefs that we disprove here. Okay, the first one is exercise will make you lose weight. And you hear this all the time. I'm, I'm running around the, the, I'm Prospect Park three times a day. How come I can't lose weight? Turns out, actually, that the more vigorous you exercise, the more your appetite is and the more you're likely to eat. And people tend to underestimate and overestimate the workout and how many calories. So that if you do once around Prospect Park running around and you lose 250 calories and then you go and have a bran muffin in Starbucks, you get 400 calories back. So there seems to be a disconnect there. So exercise you do to make you feel better, to, to what, make your heart feel better, but to lose weight, no. Now another thing, you know, you're a young woman, you find a lump in your breast. That means that you have at least a 50% chance of cancer. Actually, finding a lump in the breast in a, in a premenopausal woman has a, a chance of cancer below 10%. And in a woman who's gone through menopause, about 20%. So actually, the great majority of these turn out to be negative. <coughs> and the reason I say this is that mean, doesn't mean if you find a lump that you don't do anything about it. It means that you, you don't have to be so petrified that it's going to be cancer, because most of the time you're going to get an answer that it's not cancer, it's some kind of benign tumor, and nothing to worry about. So please, if you do feel a lump, get in there and you know, get the mammogram, get the biopsy if necessary, but go in there confident knowing that the odds are in your favor. And finally, you may have seen this on Seinfeld, you're, you're at a party, there's guacamole dip. You go in, you take the thing, you eat it, and then you go back for the second dip. Is that a problem? Is that a problem as far as bacteria? And they did studies, of, you know, believe it, people have nothing better to do. They went and did the study with the double dip. You get about 10,000 calories of bacteria with each dip. So if the guy dips it three times, you're going to get 30,000 calories of bacteria. So the best thing to do is when you go to a party, you look around the room and you say, if you don't mind kissing everyone in the room, then go ahead and have the dip. Otherwise, I'll probably stay away from it. Oh, and the worst dip is guacamole. 
the best dip is something very thick. So for some reason, the thick dip is good to have, but I would avoid the dip. I see Monsignor Ben is sitting out there. You don't double dip, do you, Monsignor? No. Hasn't missed a show. Actually, missed one show, I have to say, um, but in, in 12 years, which is amazing. Now, I want to say hello to Bruno and Grace, who I ran into at King's Plaza Diner. That, to me, is a sad event. I heard it's closing, the King's Plaza Diner, which is a fixture in Brooklyn for a long time. Democratic Club used to meet there, I know. Kind of a sad event, and I um, was going to be sorry to see that close at the end of the That's month. Yeah. So anyway, Grace and Bruno, it was great running into you. Great to see you. Now we get right to the quiz. And this is a kind of a tricky quiz. Who was the first president in the United States to be born in a hospital? Okay? So the first president to actually be born in a hospital. <coughs> so a new feature. Our quiz master, Linda Lapitosa, who works so hard each week, had an idea that it would, people in the audience might have quizzes that would be of interest for our show. So what I want you to do is, if you have a quiz that you think is interesting, send it in to us, at ask, or email it to us at askthedoctornetny.net. The chosen questions will be read on air, and we're going to give credit to the author of the question. So if you have anything like that, good question, send it in. Now, before we get to our guests, you know, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I had a chance to talk to Christy Latham. Now, you ask, who is that? Well, she's the supervisor of Women's Health and Lymphedema Program at the Metro Sports Med and Physical Therapist. So what she does is help women who are recovering from breast surgery. She also helps women who are pregnant that have need problem with physical therapy. And then importantly, more importantly, perhaps later on in life, women who have problems with incontinence of urine, who have had many deliveries, and this sometimes happens. Well, let's take a look and see what she had to say. And now I'm here with Christy Latham, who's been kind enough to drop by this evening. And she's a physical therapist, but she has some specialties that I thought would be of interest to our women out there. Um, particularly those who've had a number of children, those who are pregnant, and those unfortunately who have had breast cancer and have a condition called lymphedema. Now those who don't know it, the entire arm swells up like a balloon and it's disfiguring, it's embarrassing for the woman, and it could often be painful. So Christy, let's, let's start off, um, the woman's pregnant. Do you notice any pains, aches, pains that you help with there? Well, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of people would say um, a little bit of back pain is normal during pregnancy as those muscles are working over time. Um, but also um, associated with pregnancy can be a malalignment in the hip joint. We can look at that joint, see where the alignment is, put it back into alignment to decrease some of that irritation, decrease some of that pain, um, do a little bit of massage, and also strengthening um, as tolerated during pregnancy. Okay, so normally, I bet you the women are staying home, this is pregnancy, i got to put up with it. No. Not right. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of time, a lot of the issues that are addressed um, in a women's health physical therapy program are issues that um, women kind of just learn to deal with. They don't necessarily seek out help. They think, well, this is just, this is just part of it. Um, however, the this aspect of physical therapy um, gets some good relief and really makes a, a change in quality of life. Now you helped her through the pregnancy, and she liked it so much she has six more kids. Okay. Now the next thing you know, she's she's she has problems with urinating. That. You know, there's little incontinence, right. and that's another thing we tell them sometimes. You know, we're sorry you had so many kids. This happens. What do you tell them? Yeah. Well, this is another example of something that women just feel like they have to deal with. Um, delivery is um, a lot of work on the pelvic mm -hmm. floor, so um, that that pelvic floor can get. Um, kind of unbalanced quite easily and just with a little bit of training, a little focus on those muscles um, and, the, and um, realigning the coordination between the pelvic floor and the bladder, um, some of those urinary uh, symptoms can be resolved and they are not leaking. Without here. surgery? Without surgery Amazing. or Amazing. medication um, depending on the severity of it and the, um, the actual symptoms um, that they're displaying. Now the woman's had a lot of kids and stuff but now unfortunately develops breast cancer. Um, has surgery, they go in, they take the lymph nodes out to test them to see, and as we know, the arm can end up being blown up, swollen, lymphedema. Uh, uh, yes. What are the, these women are often told, you know, this is part of the problem, try and keep your arm up, you know, and it, maybe it'll help. Right. What, do you, what do you tell them? Lymphedema, unfortunately, is a chronic condition, and the lymph system is not able to regenerate itself. So when you first have that swelling, if there is evidence of swelling, then it's important to get in, see your doctor, and get treatment for it so that, that it, so it does not progress. So if there's a woman out there who knows somebody, and I guarantee you that everybody knows someone with breast cancer now, knows someone who has this condition, 
They should try and get them in. I, I, where, where do they find you? They can um, call our clinic. They need a, a prescription from their doctor to get lymphedema treatment. Um, so if they need a little bit more information about um, where to go or... It could be their primary care doctor? Them. Primary care, yes. Their oncologist. A lot of time I get um, referrals from oncologists or um, radiation oncologists. I know you're right. I know you can find you sometimes right here in Brooklyn at, uh, across the street from the New York Methodist Hospital. There's an affiliation, right? Yes. You yes, absolutely. Uh, we are here in um, Park Slope. The program uh -huh. that I do is in Park Slope, um, and so that is, you would contact there and come in for evaluation and treatment. Well, I really think it's valuable, very valuable that you came here, and I was wondering, since a picture's worth a thousand words, if you could um, show us? Some? Absolutely, and I've got a model that I'm going to okay. um, demonstrate just a little bit on. We use a couple different padding materials, a couple different layers on the skin. As we are moving the fluid, we're using the healthy lymph nodes that are across in the, over in the other armpit and mastectomy patient. In the fold of the hips, there's also clusters of lymph nodes. So we're going to open up pathways between both of those so that that lymph fluid can move, um, move through and filter itself out. Um, we would then use a short stretch bandage. It's like an ACE wrap, but it works with the muscles to pump the fluid out. Okay, so this is a complete wrapping for the arm. A patient would leave this on for about 23 hours a day. You're gonna take, leave it on until you see your lymphedema therapist the next day. At that point, we'll do more of that lymphedema massage and then rewrap so that we've got a, a new compression for that new size of arm. Um, this will continue until the swelling is completely reduced or it's plateaued. Treatment lasts anywhere from two to six weeks, five days a week. Um, it depends on how long you've had the lymphedema. Uh, once that arm is completely reduced or it's plateaued, then you'll be fitted for a permanent compression sleeve, which you'll wear during the day and, and sometimes at night. I think you showed how it could be done. It's painless and something that the women can help themselves on. And again, pregnancy, multiple pregnancy problems that we've had with the bladder. And unfortunately, if you have breast cancer, how we can deal with that. We can't thank you enough for coming. We're going to have to have you back. And um, any parting words for the women out there? Ask your doctors and um, do a little bit of research. You can uh, do Google search for any of it. And there's a lot of information out there that uh, a lot of people don't know about. Thanks again. I thank Christy for stopping by. And you have the phone number there. If you need any additional questions, feel free to call the show and we'll hook you up with, uh, with Christy. Um, we're going to get to find out who our number one caller is. I was having dinner before the show at Soto Voce over on 7th Avenue and ran into Sal Copa, big fan of the show. And he says, you know, he misses, uh, he's telling me he used to go to the Copa Cabana and he used to love it for under $35 and it's missing. And we started talking about things that are missing in New York. It could be an old movie theater like the Lowy's Kings or it could be a restaurant like Dubrow's on Kings Highway. I thought when you call in, if you have something you want to reminisce about, an old favorite haunt or a favorite spot that you used to like to go to, I'm, I'm curious to hear it from the different boroughs. So now let's get to our first caller. Could it be Joel? Could it be Mary, Maddie? Could it be Grace? Let's see. Hello. Hello. Hi, who is this? This is Maddie. Maddie, hi. You did it again, Maddie. Uh, <laughs> first caller of the night. Hi. Maddie, hi. You did it again. So what can we do? We always stump you, stump you here with that question. When, what can we do for you? Because when, now you're, you're in your early 80s. When the urine is dark. Does that mean you got an infection? Okay, is the, Maddie's urine, let's say, is dark. Does that mean she's got an infection? Mike? Yeah. Dr. Abbott? Hi. Yeah, I'm Mike Abbott. Um, if the urine is dark, yes. uh, it could be an infection, but most likely you may be dehydrated, not oh, drinking enough. That's and that true. would cause the urine to be dark. I yes. would try to drink something. Do you have any pain when you urinate? No, no. Do you have any that's difficulty a urinating? Just a little burning. A little burning. Yeah. I drink fluids and maybe see your physician then, yeah. just to make sure and do a urinalysis. Yeah. Thank you. Maddie, thanks a lot. How are you doing tonight? Um, it's okay. <laughs> All right, that's good. And we'll hear from you next week. Yeah. Okay. Have a great week. Okay. Thank Take you. Care. I want to ask, introduce our illustrious panel here tonight. We we'll start with Dr. Nikitna. Anastasia, Dr. Anastasia Nikitina, who's been with, us, been with us many times. Thank you very much for reminding me. What's new in cardiology? Anything that's earth shattering? Um, there is a couple things actually exciting, and we are cautiously excited about new medication probably will be available to us and to our patients, uh, medication called dabigatron. And this is a substitute, hopefully a substitute for a medication, which... Um, commonly given for a patient with a chronic atrial fibrillation, a Coumadin. 
the back uh, draw of a Coumadin that the patient who taking that is supposed to uh, check the level every three to four weeks with um, hopefully new medication which will be available in this or next month. Um, we patients who are taking that medication don't have to check so frequently a blood test. Uh, I'm saying that initially it's uh, hopefully and we are not fully aware of uh, side effects so as soon as we get more information, I hope uh, I'm going to tell it to patients. This sounds like some earth-shattering news For because sure. I know going to get their INRs or whatever blood test they need can be a hassle. Absolutely. How about the risk? Are the same risks? You know, you fall, you hit your head, you have to worry? The big study were done um, and it seems to be the level of risk of uh, significant bleeding is the same as a Coumadin or maybe slightly even lower. And yeah. their protection from a, a clot in a patient with atrial fibrillation is uh, the same or even a little bit better. Excellent, excellent. So we'll be, I know we're going to be getting a lot of cardiology questions, and we're looking forward, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Dr. Lombardo, who I, I can't show this book enough because uh, sleeping, I'm actually getting 10%. No, but the sleeping. I thought it was nine. It was nine. <laughs> but sleeping is such a, a critical thing, and who, who these days, for some reason, you know, they've got things on your mind, you're worried about work, the kids. You know, the, the alarm's going off, noises outside. You know, it's a big hassle. How, how do you get, I mean, first of all, I wanted you to comment on the, um, the story that we heard about this week, the, the weight gain and not sleeping. How, how, yeah. Why are they connected? Well, the centers in the brain that control uh, some of our basic instincts, uh, thirst, hunger, sleep, they're very much linked. So jet lag, for example, uh, those who suffer jet lag, the first organ system to suffer is the GI tract. So there's this tight link between sleep and eating and, and diet. So the exciting news is that the hormones that control this have been identified, ghrelin and Lipton. Oh. And we know that sleep deprivation, whether it be from bright light, which is another study that uh, spoke to uh, poor mm -hmm. sleep and, and the effects on diet, uh, anything that disturbs sleep can make you gain weight. Wow. And that's that link between the two centers for eating and sleep. Now we talk a lot about sleep apnea. You know, and a lot of people out there have heard about it. How, how would they know if they have it? It's an excellent question. And I think, if first, if you have a bed partner, mm -hmm. uh, the observation is one of gasping and snoring, loud snoring with pauses in breathing. So there'll be regular breathing and then a... Can you, can you die from that? I mean, no. can you stop breathing or you always end up breathing? You know, nature has it, thankfully, that at the last few seconds before this severe drop in, in blood oxygen, there's a, res a signal to the brain and you get a, a gasp and it's called a resuscitative gasp. It's very dramatic. I hope I don't get a busy signal when this happens. That's all I need. <laughs> so no, you do not die from this. Although those stricken with many other conditions, heart, uh, lung, can suffer terribly from an apnea event. And that's one of the dangers. Now, how do you write a book? I've, I've tried to write a book. I mean, you have a beautiful book written. Was that, was that tough? Thank you. Uh, what made it difficult is um, my wife, uh, who's also a cookbook Tell author. Me, I'm sure most people know who she is. Yeah. Well, Daisy, Daisy Martinez. Daisy Martinez, uh, who one of the top chefs and has shows. Uh, and, and she's on the... Uh, well, it's running PBS on PBS TV, now PBS. and Food Network and The Cooking Channel, which is a new development from Food Network to deal with... She's uh, a fan of the show, right? She's a big fan of the but show. But Daisy was out there... Uh, in Queen, I was in the Queen restaurant, which I love. I thought it was underestimated. And she went and told me that's her favorite restaurant. It is indeed, yeah, when it comes to Italian food. And I know you're certainly an authority on restaurants in, in all of the boroughs. But Queen <laughs> is our favorite here in Brooklyn for Italian it's food. tremendous. Yeah. So we're looking forward to answering these questions because I, I know Thank who you. gets... What's a good night? By the way, I have to just ask you, what, what is a good night's sleep? How many hours? Well, seven to eight is what's tossed around all the time. But I have patients coming in saying five is enough. Um, it depends on their quality of life. So there's a range, but seven to eight is the What if I'm just lying range. there, but I'm awake? Does that count? Well, it does to the extent that, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the nap. Uh -huh. You know, there's controversy about nap or not. Actually, the subject of my mm -hmm. second book, if I can get through it. Um, so a meditative state where you're relaxed and breathing quietly is beneficial, but it's not true mm -hmm. sleep. Anyway, thanks for looking forward. I know a lot of calls are going to come. And Dr. Abbott, who I wanted to have on the show for a long time, we finally got you here. Tell us a little bit about, you know, you've, you've accomplished so much in your life in medicine. Tell us a little bit about what you've really, um, how you've organized this, you know, the groups. Well, I first have to uh, thank my family, my two children, Stephen and Richie, my wife, Beth. And um, I would say that uh, there was a need 
for physicians to get together. And when the physicians uh, get together, uh, there seems to be a symbiosis uh, working together, improve quality of care because people uh, communicate. And if physicians communicate, you can have a better quality of care. How many years do you have this organization? 11 years. The borough, um, what's the name of the organization? United Medical Associates. United Medical. For how many years? 11 years. 11. So he was really ahead of his time. This is before Obamacare and all the, the HMOs started taking over. Absolutely. What's that? Amazing. Thank uh, you. Are you from New York? I'm from uh, Brooklyn, actually. Oh. Where'd you go to high school? Uh, went to James Madison oh, High School. Good school. A lot of chief justices and right. famous people. Exactly. exactly. Anybody exactly. famous in your class? Uh, no. No, no. I, I'm saying that now. I'm going to a reunion in a couple of weeks. Uh, I hope I haven't missed anybody. But. It's great to have you. Are you saying they're a great tennis player? Uh, I like tennis. I'm not great. Okay. Good tennis player. So in my yeah. class, by the way, at Midwood High School, 1969, Didi Khan, who later played in Greece. Yes. Do you remember yes. Greece? Yeah. Yes. So. Just throw, throw. Did you have anybody famous in your class in high school? No, no. Okay. I can't remember. <laughs> we don't know who. It's good as it's made up. So let's let's go right to the email question before we get to Marie on line two. The email's from Mary, and she says, "I'm glad to find your Ask the Doctor TV program has this opportunity to email questions. I'm writing today about my mammogram. First had no findings. Then <laughs> about two years later, they saw increased density. Then some clustered calcifications." Um, the recommendation was to repeat the mammogram, it, it was done, and then she had some suspicious areas uh, on that. And the question is, I'm going to assume the question, here's the question, the, the, the results are suspicious for malignancy, how worried should she be? And again, I just want to say, you know, we do a lot of mammograms, and again, many times, probably up to a, a third of people who are just coming in for regular mammograms have to go for additional tests because we do have these non-invasive ways to evaluate. Example, sonograms. Using sound waves, we can tell if a lesion is benign or malignant. There are other lesions that we can tell. We call um, indeterminate, and, and we need a biopsy. Biopsy of the breast is actually looks barbaric because you're putting a needle into the breast, but thank God there, there are really no pain receptors in the breast. So the, we numb the skin, and then there's really no pain after that. Uh, it's something, findings of malignancy, I would definitely follow your doctor's opinion. I'm, I'm reading her email. It was about three pages as I'm talking to you. Um, I would go to biopsy at this point. It's the, nobody can really tell. Once you have uh, suspicious calcifications, it's anybody's guess, and there's no point in guessing, and this can save your life because the earlier we pick it up, the less likely that it is going to be spread when we get it. Does anybody else have a comment on that on the panel? I think you took care of it very well. Okay. So now we're going to move on. Now we've got everything out of the way. Let's go to Maria. We start, a, we start our road here. Marie? No, Marie? I'm... How are you? Marie, can you speak up a little bit? I think our problem is laryngitis that we have. Marie? Okay. We're going to do, um, Marie, we're going to come back to you. We're going to ask you to call back again. I don't know, um, we're having difficulty with your phone, but try and call us back. We're now going to go to, to James, who, um, James? Jane. Jamie, how are you doing? No, Jane, from Middle Village. Oh, from Middle Village. Hi, how are you? Can you get a little closer to the phone? Right. Beautiful, beautiful. The answer to the quiz is Jimmy Carter. Now, wait a second. No, no, you, we, gotta, we don't just do it like that. We've got to play this question up. So, wait, I'm going to ask you because I have sound effects. I have a whole team. You're going to put them out of work. All right, James? Okay. Okay. So, James, you think you might have the answer to the quiz? Yes. Okay. Who is it? Jimmy Carter. Okay. I'm going to the judges for their opinion. Judges? Oh, I can't believe it. The first, you, you, James, you knocked out everybody else on the line. What happened? I don't know. know. What, what gave it away? My husband is very smart. Oh, okay, okay. He knew it. Did he get it? Yeah. Isn't that amazing that nobody was born in a hospital until Carter? Yeah. Kennedy? Kennedy, these people were born at home. Oh, I want to tell you something else. Yes. There's two websites. You can, uh, you can uh, check everything up on a doctor. One okay. is called vitals.com. Yes. And the other is healthgrades.com. Good point. And this way, patients can then, before they go to the doctor, can get an idea. If their you background, know, their education, everything. Excellent, excellent. I think you're going to. Did it? You can't find I, the answers to the quiz on there, can you? No. no. And I see you. I see you're from Chicago. You went to school in Chicago. Very good. 
And you got uh, four stars across the board. Oh, thank you. Is, what's the highest? There's, uh, one website has four, the other has five. All right, four. so four is good. Yes, thank excellent. You. Thanks, James. So, James, you got to... Jane. Jane, sorry, Jane, we're going to rush this plaque to you. Do you have a place picked out where it's going? In the living room. You see that? This is it's beautifully handmade in Japan. Oh, okay. So, best of luck. Thanks so much for calling. Any medical questions tonight? No, remember, I'm the one with the bloating, with the gastroparesis. I remember it. Very, how is it coming along? Okay, and you know the um, pleural effusion? Yes, yes, on the I left side. Back, right, I went back to the pulmonologist, and uh, for some reason now it's, it's not there. It cleared up. Excellent, excellent. And we had the rheumatologist discuss some possibilities for fluid. Thanks so much for calling, Jane. Okay. Take care. Take Be care. well. Let's go to Joe. Joe. Good evening. Is this Joe Stiles? Yes, yeah, speaking. How are you doing tonight, Joe? Not bad. I'm, you know, trying hard. Well, well. We missed the birthday, I understand. Yes. How old were you? I was, I was the youngest, 93, in Brooklyn. Wow, amazing. And Joe's never getting old. Time is passing by and getting better. Continues to work tirelessly at, um, working huh? at the community hospital, right? On the board? Yeah, well, I'm the senior member of the board of New York. I mean, that's part of Methodist and we're part of New York Presbyterian. So, Joe, what can we do for you tonight? Well, I was, uh, doctor, I, I got a, uh, I got a, am I on? Yes, you're on. Okay. I got a, a, a tumor on my neck. I just had it checked out by biopsy with a computer, and it, that guy's not cancerous. But now I, I'm going to see another doctor, a toad, eye, a toad nose and ear doctor, and I'm going to make my next step to see what I got to do. What do you think I should do with something? It's near my thyroid or it's near my vocal cords? Okay. Um, any, Mike? Yeah. Um, Joe? Yeah. Joe? Mr. Joe Stiles. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Stiles. Um, do you know the, uh, what kind of tumor it was besides well, benign? It's, uh, well, right now, it's benign, you know. They just went to a guy and he did it with a computer. They have a computerized, uh, they only do the neck and head and they do it with a computer. Very nice. Now, if it's benign, first of all, congratulations. You're very lucky. Yeah, I'm lucky on that part, but now I want to find out further and if I have to go for a third opinion, I'm going to go. I think it's very important when you got something that's really not bothering you and you've got time to go second, third, and fourth uh, opinion. Before you go for a second or third opinion, make sure everybody you know, knows what you want. Make sure that everybody knows what oh, yeah. your ideas are. Right, and, right. and make sure that, that not only do you have to make up your mind, but you should talk to other people as well. Yeah, that's right. When I get, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, though. After I get all my reports in my hand, I'm going to have Dr. Garner take a look at him himself uh, when I see him. I, uh, he makes a great image. He's a role model, a great leader in what he does on educating the people for their health on uh, Channel 30. Joe, I think thanks we need, a lot. We need more programs of uh, that type on the air. Thanks a lot, Joe. We look forward to hearing from you soon, okay? Hey, God bless. And listen, I want to tell you, you used to about three more theaters. You had the Kenmore there. You had the album more there, you had the Glenwood, and on Crawford's you had the Marine and the Brook. Those, those old movie theaters, which bring back a memory. Do you remember the first movie theater you went to? Anybody? Or one I of your think first? it was um, the Alpine. The oh. Alpine on Fifth Avenue. In, in nice. Glenwood. It's not there That's anymore, there. right? Is it? Or it's, is it there? It changed. It is. It, it is there, but it's changed. That was the first movie theater. Mike, do you remember? You? Marlboro. The Marlboro. Uh, I saw Jaws there. Right. Yeah. I mean, many years ago. Oh. Joe, thanks a lot. Bring back the memories. Okay, we're going now to Rosemary, who we haven't heard from yet this year. Hi, Rosemary. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Hi, did you make it to Manchester this year? Yes, I did. I was looking for you. <laughs> well, I'm always looking for you. I never see you anywhere. <laughs> no, no. I was shopping with my wife and stuff. Over I there. know. Yeah. I'm, I'm always looking for you. Everywhere I go, I oh. know you go to Manchester, you go to Parkside. But I'm never where you are. <laughs> one, one time, one time. Oh, when, when I see you, you're going to know. <laughs> it's one of my favorite. Um... I'm going to jump up and down. Oh. First of all, I want to say something. Your uh, the uh, what you wrote in the tablet was great. The chronic fatigue. Oh uh, yes. Article. Yes. I suffer from that, and I really, I'm glad you put it out there because people, they don't understand it. They think you're crazy, and I've had it for 13 years, so I've been suffering with that. But I'm hanging in there. <laughs> it was a good episode on the Golden Girls. I, I somehow got yeah, hooked right, on the Golden Girls. That's how it started. I don't that's know how I got hooked on it. You know, yeah. <laughs> I have to watch. Well, you, you ever watch that? Well, yeah. this this 
next question is, um, it's about the statin drugs. Okay, we have and, Dr. Nikita right. here. Right. And now what I want to ask is, you know, the side effects versus the benefits. Now, if you're a patient, say 82 years old, now I know that there are some uh, studies that they say that it causes uh, some dementia, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't know if, you know if you've heard this, but I heard it on Dr. Oz. I also watch him. Now, um, as far as if you... Uh, you're on high blood pressure medication, and also this, this someone in my family takes a Tenolol because she has a problem like with her heart. It just keeps running kind of. It doesn't shut off the valve, one of the valves. And lately, since she's been on this Simvastatin, I think it's called, mm -hmm. she's been having um, kind of like episodes of a sort of like forgetfulness. I don't know if it's just coming with age. But is it really a benefit for her to take it if she her cholesterol levels are good? Rosemary, I have that. Because it's unusual to hear this, right? Rosemary, thank you very much for your question. Yes. It's actually an excellent question because um, many of my patients come to me and say, I'm 80 year old and uh, above, and I'm taking medication. I'm concerned about memory because at this point of time, memory becomes a very important part of our functionality. Mm -hmm. And what I can tell you personally, First of all, uh, side effects of medication depends on the dose. So on average, if you're taking average dose, uh, m medium dose, uh, the side effects, potentially side effects is much, much lower. Second of all, all the study which came about dementia and worsening memory mm -hmm. probably coming from um, some biased opinion. The longer we live, and think to statin medication, aspirin, and uh, beta blockers, metoprolol, tenolol. The longer we live, the chances that our memory will decline are much higher. Mm. So um, I truly believe that if you're taking medication, you can prolong life from a, a heart standpoint of view. Right. Uh, you won't have a problem with a uh, um, stroke or heart attack, mm. and obviously memory, with, at this point of time, we don't have medication to improve memory. So right. memory will not decline uh, down. If you do have a problems with the valves, um, there are calcification, calcification on the valves. I do recommend to take um, statin medication, even though um, lipid profile, your bad cholesterol is within normal limits. Right. And Nikita, isn't it, wasn't there some studies showing that it actually may be protective for factors as far as Alzheimer's for people taking Yeah, I heard that too. The studies coming back and forth, I know. and still we don't have clear understanding, but still we're talking about the heart, mm -hmm. and since uh, death from a heart attack much higher at this point of time than from from Alzheimer, then I would stay on the side of the continuum medication. Rosemary, I great agree. to hear from you. Thank Hope that you. helped. Okay, we'll see you. Thanks. Call back soon. Take care. Hi, Maria. Hi. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn. Oh, uh, so what? What do you miss about uh, the, you know, an old something that's missing? A restaurant, a movie theater? What? What's? Oh, uh, we're missing about a lot of things that have changed in this area. Uh, of course, uh, some of the uh, the restaurant, the Italian restaurants, and uh, of course we miss our movie house. Uh, we what? had a nice one. We still have one that's pretty nice. What was your movie theater in Cobble Hill? Oh, that was a long time, long before your time. Uh, it was called uh, the Gloria. The Gloria. <laughs> I never. Yeah, well, you wouldn't. But do we have Cobble Hill that's very nice. Oh, that's a nice theater, the Cobble Hill. Right. And uh, some of our, the, the only bad thing in our neighborhood, we lost our key food. Uh, most people in the neighborhood don't have a large supermarket to oh. shop in. So uh, people find it very hard to shop in the neighborhood. All right. Uh, hopefully things improve. What can we do for you? Okay. I was wanted to talk about uh, a cardiologist. I'm, I'm a heart patient, and uh, I'm on a lot of drugs. And I was wondering, is it still safe to continue taking the same drugs for a long a period of time? Or should I get another opinion from another cardiologist? I've had a few um, heart procedures. And I'm a little undecided right now what I should do. I have a defibrillator. I have two cents. I was intubated. Um, I had heart failure. And I'm on like nine medications a day. And um, somebody said, you know, maybe uh, I should have it looked at and maybe uh, there's a way to cut down on some of this medication. But they claim I should take it, so I don't know what to do. <laughs> Why are you concerned um, about the number of medication? To? Why exactly are you concerned about number? Well, if I say 15 or 7, would it be make a difference for you? 
Who am I talking to? This is I'm Dr. Nikitina. Nikitina. I'm huh? a cardiologist. I'm talking to a cardiologist? Yes. Well, I, you know, they say if you're on the uh, same medication for a long period of time, it's not good. Is that true? It's not true. There is no evidence that if you're taking the same medication, which are working for you, means they keep your blood pressure perfect, your, they keep your cholesterol sugar level perfect. Well, There's I no take heart pills. I take the Jackson uh, Corette. I take Diavan. It, it I take sounds. It sounds from what you, I'm sorry. I uh, interrupt you. It sounds from what you told me that you have defibrillator. It means that you're um, actually very lucky. Uh, lucky in a way that uh, technology at this time are such that we can keep. Uh, people who otherwise would not be with us alive um, for a long, long time with medication and with the devices like defibrillators. Um, unfortunately, several years, a little decade probably from now, we did not have a defibrillator. We did not have a medication like a Carvedil or Corec you mentioned. And uh, we knew that people who don't take that medication actually li live longer. So by taking medication, and it doesn't matter how many pills, it doesn't matter how many pieces uh, when you eat, if you eat vegetables, if you have a mixture of vegetables, you don't count, or have only one carrot, or have carrot right. and, uh, and the corn and a little bit of um, potato. It's the most important, the effect of this, the most important is the result. And the result is how you feel and how you live longer. I see. Thank you. We hope that um, that helps. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to say goodbye. I want to ask Dr. Lombardo a quick question before we go to the break. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Uh, the question I had: Do you sometimes find that pills are what's keeping a patient up? You know, it's on like eight different pills, and then you detect them, you find one. Absolutely. Yeah, it's often a cause of insomnia. That being the inability to get to sleep or stay asleep. So that one of the first things is to do a medicine profile. Ask, ask the person what pills they're taking. And I wanted to ask Dr. Uh, Mike Abbott, do you find that people with lung problems, is there some pill that if you have, let's say, bronchitis, you should avoid? You know? Well, if you have bronchitis, you should, you should look at the medication you're taking. Specifically, beta blockers can cause problems with bronchitis. <clears throat> but I would like to add from a geriatric standpoint, mm -hmm. um, if you're taking more than five medications, errors occur. And you have to be very careful. And I would suggest to everybody who's taking all of these medications uh, that they have a pill box, that they bring their bottles to the doctor at every visit just to make sure everything is organized for them. It is very, very important that you know what you're taking, when you take it, and if you are confused about it, tell somebody. <clears throat> if you don't know, have a pill box to take in the morning afternoon and the evening. Very good. So we're going to take a little break, give everybody a chance to catch his breath, her breath, and then we're going to move on. So we're going to come right back and talk about cardiology, sleep medicine, and lung disease, and geriatric medicine. Now the number to call is 718-499-6101, and the emails, which we're also going to get to very shortly, at askthedoctor at netny.net. We'll be right back. <music> I'm Dr. Steve Garner, the host of Ask the Doctor. In addition to watching Ask the Doctor every Tuesday night at 8, you can also visit www.netny.net slash askthedoctor. There you can find the topics and guests of each episode. You can read my column from the week for the tablet, and for more advice, you can watch episodes you've missed. More importantly, you can post your questions and I'll answer them on the video blog. So visit www.netny.net slash doctor and get your daily dose of healthy advice. Welcome back to Ask the Doctor, where our topics are cardiology, sleep medicine and lung disease, and geriatric medicine. Now we're going to get to the questions. And I know that we have an, an email question, I believe, pending, so I'm just going to wait for it to come up on the computer. Here we go. It's, it's from Kathy about vertigo and Lipitor. And she's been sick with, lipid, with vertigo since August 17, 2010. And um, she wants to know, could this possibly be related to Lipitor? Vertigo and Lipitor. And then she wants to know the treatment. So um, Dr. Abbott, do you want to comment on what uh, vertigo is? Well, vertigo is the sensation that the room is spinning around you. I'd like to differentiate vertigo uh, from dizziness, which is a general feeling that you're off balance, and I would like to 
differentiate that from lightheadedness. Lightheadedness means that you can't see too well or you feel tired. Uh, vertigo is when the room is spinning, and that is usually caused by the vestibular system. The vestibular system is the system that is attached to the ears to the brain, where there are uh, multiple things like carpenter's levels in the ears that tell you where you are in space. When there's a problem there, you feel like the room is spinning, uh, like you're in a bad position and you could fall down. Um, Lipitor, um, I don't, ha have not seen any studies causing, Lipitor causing uh, vertigo, but the treatment for vertigo is, is very often, if you've had it for such a long time, you could have a, uh, the most common cause of vertigo, which is benign positional vertigo. Mm -hmm. Benign positional vertigo is when you get dizzy, the room spins, when you lie down, when you sit up, when you change your position. Uh, there are medications for it, there's physical therapy for it, where you get rid of the problem in the, in the carpenter's levels. And there are certain maneuvers that your doctor can do. Is it, is it um, life-threatening? It, if, if it's caused by benign positional vertigo, it is not life-threatening. But it can be caused by a tumor, either in the ear, in the nerve sheath, or in the brain. So is that something, I, should I go to the doctor, should I ask for a scan? Am I, if this is happening, should I get a CAT scan or I something? I think you need to be examined, and the doctor will look for nystagmus, and will look for physical findings that are consistent with the, with the disease. Thank you. It's a two-part question, Dr. Nikita. Patient uh, wants to know if she has to be fasting when she goes to have her cholesterol checked. She's on. Absolutely, it's the best thing to do to check if Lipitor we're taking for a while is working is to take a blood test on fasting, so you don't have to eat anything after midnight and first thing in the morning to have a blood test because this is the only test which is affected by the food you eat. Okay, we're going to get to our phone calls now. Thank you. Uh, I know a couple of people get tired hanging on, but we're going to get to everyone here, so call back. Oh, Jerry? Yes. Hi, Jerry. Um, I understand you have a question about cough? Yes. Where are you calling from? Park Slope, Brooklyn. Park Slope. And what, what is it, um, what, is, what in the past, what, what institution in the neighborhood, restaurant or so on, do you miss the most? Uh, I like Rosewater on Union Street. But that's still there. We're looking for things that are no longer, like Ebinger's Cake. You know, something like that. Well, I liked Avengers Cake, but pretty uh, good. I can't think of anything right now in the neighborhood that I like that isn't here anymore. Usually when I like something, it stays around. Very good, Jeff. So what can we do? What's the, what's the question, and who do you want to ask it of? Uh, I want to ask one of the pulmonary specialists, maybe Dr. Abbott. Okay. Um, I had this cough at night, and my doctor told me that it was due to acid in my stomach, and, I, and he gave me a medicine for acid. And I don't understand what the relationship is between coughing and acid in the stomach. Very good question, Jerry. Um, acid in the stomach is not the problem. There's supposed to be acid in the stomach. The problem is that the acid at night in some people come up through the esophagus, the tube that connects the stomach to the mouth, and it comes up and then you inhale some of it. And that causes some inflammation which makes you cough. Uh, the way your doctor is treating it is by reducing the acid in your stomach, by increasing the pH, by giving you medicine to help with that. Very important to understand as well is that caffeine and alcohol contribute to acid reflux. So it's very important to, number one, not drink alcohol. Number two, don't drink coffee after afternoon. And the third, and you, and I'm sorry to say this to a lot of people, but chocolate has a lot of caffeine in it. So you have to be careful of that. Jerry, yes. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you very okay. much. Take care. Okay. Okay, we're now going to, I see we have a, an email question for Dr. Lombardo. Patient writes, my daughter's four years old and she currently is having a cough. Initially, we approached a pediatrician who prescribed amoxicillin. As, the pediatrician, uh, as per the pediatrician, my daughter had a throat infection. After 10 days of amoxicillin, the treatment uh, did not work. There wasn't any improvement, so we went to an ENT specialist who mentioned she has sinus infection and prescribed Augmentin for 10 days. Now the cough still exists, and she's not fully recovered. Thank God she didn't go to another doctor. We got another uh, antibiotic. Although they gave her nebulizer two times a day. Why is the cough not going away? 
and why aren't the antibiotics working? And how am I going to get rid of this runny nose uh, on, on my daughter, who's four years old? Okay, and this is, um, she writes, she's from Paramel, she's Paramel in Queens. So tell Paramel what's going on here. Paramel, uh, certainly it looks like your doctors uh, took you through proper treatment for a bacterial infection. That's what antibiotics treat, a bacteria. But cough is often related, especially in the pediatric population, to things like allergies. And also, we heard about GERD in adults. Well, children can also have acid reflux. It presents a little differently, but it is a cause of, of cough, especially in the nighttime, if you notice a pattern. So I think the thing to do, I did see the ENT doctor, and certainly some ENT doctors treat allergies and screen for allergies, but it might be a good idea to pursue the allergy uh, angle, if you will, and, and see an allergist. Let them do a skin panel and take a very careful history uh, for allergies. Paramel, it's a beautiful name. I'm not sure the it derivation, is. It but is it's, it's call us up and, and give us an idea of where that comes from, okay? Good to talk to you. Now we'll go to Eddie. Hi, Eddie. How you doing, sir? How you doing? You talk a little louder into that phone, all right? Yeah, okay. Beautiful. Where are you calling us from? Okay, I'm calling from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, New York. Benson, what's, what's missing out there aside from Jan's restaurant? Uh, Miss I had maybe uh, Junior's Cheesecake. Oh, that's still around, though, still Junior's around Cheesecake. Cheesecake. Yeah, I, but you know something? My wife and mother-in-law make excellent cheesecake. Better than Junior's. Much. Much. You're going to send some over to the station, a little souvenir? Oh, we could. Uh, but it would be nice. Maybe uh, next week we'll test it on the air. <laughs> All right? Okay. So, Eddie, what can we do for you? Okay, the question has to do with heart rate. Okay. Okay, the doctor told me that I should get my heart rate up. And the question is, what would be a better exercise, a nice, intense workout on a stationary bike or a nice, fast, brisk walk? Oh, okay. Should he go outside and walk or should he get on that stationary bike? The problem with the walking outside is that in the bad weather, like yesterday night, you won't be able to. So you're basically cutting down your amount of exercise. If it's possible for you to go on a bicycle or in a gym or anything, if you have at home something to exercise, would be probably the preferable way. Not the difference in the heart rate, just because of, of convenience. Okay, all right. But, but uh, uh, the cold weather doesn't affect me any, so, you know, uh, that wouldn't be a problem. Rain and snow. Okay, good. Are you doing any weights? No, no, really no weights. Just a lot of calisthenics, you know, stationary bike, uh, walking, you know, just stuff like that. That's good, that's good. Any, any tips, Dr. Lombardo? For exercise? Yeah, for his, his question. Well, certainly, uh, if we talk about sleep, you don't want to exercise right before sleep. So that's, uh, that's of key importance. And you want to do something within your capacity. Uh, and certainly not to overdo it or, or risk injury. So okay, uh, uh, one last fast question. Sure. Okay, uh, stationary bike walking, that brings the heart rate up. How about uh, uh, a good heavy bag workout? Would that bring the excess uh, or the heart rate up too? Oh, heavy bag. He heavy, ba heavy bag. Heavy bag What's the heavy bag? Is, heavy bag is uh, a bag that you use in the gym for boxing. I was ready to exactly. hit the, I thought he said heavy bag. I was ready to hit the I think the, the uh, most important thing about a heavy bag what? is to have a good set of gloves and to make sure your wrists are bound, to make right. sure you don't injure your hands. Okay, H how old are you? Uh, 56. And how, how much do you weigh? Uh, uh, maybe 192. I'm about 15-something over, over, pounds overweight. Uh, okay, I mean, I, I, think, I think a heavy bag... Workout is, is very good. It has been shown to be very good. Uh, just don't hurt your hands. Okay, I appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Eddie. Yeah. I like that accent. Very good at Bensonhurst. Very good. <laughs> Willie takes my wife's cheesecake. Okay, we're looking for next week. Okay, you're going to have it. Take care, Eddie. Okay. Good man. Okay. <laughs> hey, Mary. Getting a lot of Marys tonight, right? Mary? Hello, doctor. Hi, where are you calling us from, Mary? I'm calling from Jackson Heights, doctor. Oh, they're very nice, very nice. How long are you living out there? Oh, quite a few years, maybe 20 years. Wow, so what, what's missed? What do you really miss the most? What I mean, well, I go to Jan's Cavalier's restaurant used to be here. And Jan's, right? I really right? miss that. You know that Jan's ice cream is that's the last one left? It's the last mm -hmm. one left, and it's Heights. so good. It's on 81st Street. Did you get a chick uh, kitchen sink? Yes, and, and uh, the food is great, doctor, and very reasonably priced. We have to get out there. Where is it, where is it located? To. 
It's 81st Street and 37th Avenue. Dr. Nikita, did you ever hear of this place? The best ice, ice cream, cream parlor, the best. Oh, oh the best ice cream, cream, doctor, and the best and wonderful waiters and waitresses. I went to Russia last year, actually, on a trip. I don't know, have you been to St. Petersburg? Of course I've been there. Not bad, the ice cream there. That's my childhood. Very good, right? Your childhood in St. Petersburg? No, just childhood was ice cream, like, from oh. Russia. Beautiful, that ice cream. From, you know, they, I think they call it St. Petersburg ice cream. Yeah. yeah, it was a good... <laughs> but, um, so, what can we do for you, Mary? Well, Doctor, I wanted to ask Dr. Abbott if uh, I, last year, they found two nodules in my left lung. Okay. And Are you a smoker? No, I never smoked in my life. Very good. And uh, I was, now this year I was back to my doctor for my physical, and she said I didn't have to worry about them. But I was wondering, uh, she said, except there'd be a lump come out or something in my back. Okay, let's ask Dr. Abbott. Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and you're not a smoker. How old are you? I'm in my 70s. In your 70s? And have you ever worked in a shipyard or, or worked with asbestos? No, never. Okay. Um, most likely, uh, these, these lesions, these marks are benign. Um, but I would say to you the following. Um, <clears throat> number one, uh, what they probably did is looked at CAT scans of your lung and made sure that they didn't grow over a period of a year or two. Right. Um, there's a new technology coming where they're going to be able to biopsy these, th these tiny nodes with a special computer and a bronchoscope. That may be the future, just to make sure, so they don't have to keep exposing people to the radiation. But I think you're very safe now, and I would uh, just listen to your doctor, and don't worry about it. Thank you so much, doctor. Could I ask you another question from my friend? Okay. And what... Uh, what age can do the stop you from getting a colonoscopy? Do they stop you? Yes, at what age? Okay. Uh, I mean, there was a study that study, came out. A study, study, study showed that over, over the age of 70 or 75, 75. 75 that uh, colonoscopy uh, after that is, is probably not indicated without any symptoms. So you don't need to get one? No. You know, but it's always, I mean, if you have bleeding or something, right. then you definitely want to get it checked out, changing bowel habits. But as a rule, it becomes, because the chances of you dying from colon cancer become so small that it's not worth the risk of the right. colonoscopy. Right. So I hope that helps you. It helps me very well. And thank you so much, Dr. Gardner and Dr. Abbott. Very good. I want to ask Dr. Um, Lombardo, as you get older, do you need, is it true that you need less sleep? Like, does an 80-year-old need less sleep than a 40-year-old? Actually, no. Um, what happens is, uh, in the elderly, there's more of a tendency to have disrupted sleep uh, from, we heard about many medications or associated conditions that give pain. So sleep is not as restful. As a result, naps are taken during the day uh, to make up for the disrupted sleep. When the naps kick in, it counts as sleep if you sleep long enough and that deprives you of the need to sleep a solid seven, eight hours. And the perception is, look at this, I'm only sleeping four, five hours. I don't need as much as uh, my younger days. Excellent. Okay, before we get back to our busy phone line here. We go to Peter. Hi, Peter. Yes. Where are you calling us from, Pete? Uh, this is from uh, Borough Park, section of Brooklyn. Borough Park. And what's missing in Borough Park? What's missing in Borough Park? That was there 20 years ago, and it can't find it anymore. Uh, I would say. Uh, I was going to say Edel a good roast beef sandwich. You just can't well, get it. Edelman's about. delicatessen. Yeah, the, with Edelman's. Yes. Does everybody, anybody remember Edelman's? Yes. I think it was on Church uh, Avenue near. Uh, no, 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 13th Avenue. 13th, 13th, sorry. Yeah, it's too bad that's gone. Very few delis around, have you noticed? The right. Mill Basin Deli and um, Jay and Lloyd's, maybe. What can we do? Uh, I'm curious about uh, is there any danger in taking both. Plavix and low-dose aspirin. Hmm. Interesting. Who wants to weigh in on that? It depends on what, why you're taking aspirin and Plavix for. Uh, had an episode of uh, what they call amaurosis fugax. Okay. So, you can't see. It's start getting floating. Uh, amaurosis fugax is, is uh, I, I believe, uh, temporal arteritis. Uh, right? And... 
I, I, a temporary I, I, interruption of the, of the vision. Of vision. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think that um, there are different different causes for that, and there are different medications. But but generally, uh, aspirin and Plavix can be given in different areas, especially for vascular disease or patients who have stents and stuff like that. I'm going to have to move on because we've got four people on the line. We have one, one, one minute left. So we'll go to Marie. Hi, Marie. Hi. Marie, hi. Where are you calling us from? From Howard Beach, Queens. From, and what's missing in Howard Beach? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. Everything's still there. You still yeah. got Frank Russo out there? Sure. I like that place. Okay. You don't think much of it? Uh, pardon me? Frank Russo's place? Yeah, very nice. Very nice. What can we do for you? Well, I want to know is when they're going to come out with the, with the computer that um, diagnoses without an MRI of the lungs? Oh, so you want to know about the CAT scan of the lungs that could pick up these tiny little nodules right. before because you I'm, see them? I'm claustrophobia and I hate to go through the machines. <laughs> Oh, it's Dr. Lombardo and then Dr. Abbott. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I think um, as we speak, there is no substitute uh, for a CAT scan other than a stand-up uh, type of, of a machine uh, for those who are claustrophobic. It's called an open uh, scanner. Um, but I'm not aware, and, and I, I know that our good Dr. Uh, Garner would be able to speak to new technologies in radiology better than I. What we have is a software that we put on the CAT scan, and it can pick up these tiny, tiny nodules. The only problem is we don't know what to do with it once we see it. Is that a cancer? Is that, what is that? So it, it may be of use in people who are chronic smokers, but the um, best thing is not to smoke at all. But you've got to speak to your doctor because... A lot of times, more damage is done because you see something, it turns out to be nothing, and now you've had surgery that you didn't really need. Dr. Abbott? Yeah, what I was speaking about before is um, what they can do with a bronchoscope is put a sonogram machine mm. with, with the bronchoscope and, and take biopsies. But that's uh, a, a, something that really hasn't come out yet. Um, but right now, CAT scan is going to be the gold standard for this. Maria, and there's a lot of big gantries, we call it, where you don't feel so claustrophobic, right. so we hope that helps. And last call of the night, I'm just going to say hello, and then I'm going to move on. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm sorry. The last call of the night, they're, they're going like this. I can't really talk to you, but what was the topic going to be? Uh, sleep apnea. Oh, my. We would need that, too. Yeah. Sleep, give it to us. What's your problem? It, uh, it, it just... <laughs> Uh, you know what? I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to come call next week. I'm going to put you on first, and we're going to go over sleep apnea. Okay. Okay. I'm really sorry. I don't know. You guys come on. We can't finish the show here. There's too many callers over here. I want to. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Dr. Anastasia Nikitina, Dr. Gerard Lombardo, and Dr. Michael L. Abbott for coming in. We hope we've been able to help you, and it's good to remember you should be proactive about your health. Speak to your doctors about your concerns. Go for second or, or even third opinions. We'll see you again next week where we're going to be talking about pediatric neurology, <coughs> non-invasive imaging, and emergency medicine. In the meantime, visit our website at netny.net slash doctor for my video blogs, the tablet column, podcast, forum, send in your quiz suggestions, and many more. You can also watch... No, this is your really glutton for Ask the Doctor punishment. You can watch last week's episode tonight at 10 p.m. And then every morning at 10 a.m. you can continue to watch our show. I want to thank doc uh, Doctor, but Miss Linda Lapitosa, our quiz master. And thank you for all your questions. I want to wish you a great week. Goodbye, and I'll see you on the tablet.